Okay, so today we are talking about Chapter 5, which is the Dynamic Activities of Cells. So we're going to be talking about transport, and we're going to be talking about the plasma membrane, and we're going to be talking about junctions, and then we're going to move into energy, how we get at that energy, and enzymes. So first and foremost, the plasma membrane, remember it separates or it goes around the entire cell. Its function is twofold. It is a barrier between the inside and the outside of the cell. So it separates the internal from the external and it regulates material that comes in and out of the cell. It's what we call selectively permeable. So that means that it only lets certain things in and out of the cell. The structure of the plasma membrane, as you can see in the picture at the bottom there, it's mosaic because of all of the proteins that are interspersed throughout it and the cholesterol molecules and the glycolipids, which we'll talk about in a minute. And it's fluid because it has phospholipids that make up the double bilayer. So this is what allows it to be selectively permeable. So again, it's a phospholipid bilayer. So the bilayer itself is made up of phospholipids. You have the hydrophilic or polar heads and the hydrophobic or nonpolar tails, and it gives it kind of that olive oil consistency. It's gonna be a barrier between the inside and the outside of the cell. And we're going to have molecules called cholesterol embedded throughout the plasma membrane. Those are the little, little yellow things on the picture there. So what cholesterol does is it actually helps the membrane maintain its fluidity. So the cholesterol molecules, if it gets really cold, the membrane has a tendency to get really solid. So the cholesterol molecules can actually push the phospholipids apart and keep it fluid or semi-fluid, I should say. And if it gets too hot, the membrane has a tendency to get really fluid. So the cholesterol molecules can hang on to the phospholipids and keep them closer together. So cholesterol, remember, is a steroid. You have those four carbon-fused rings. Then we have proteins dispersed between the phospholipids. Those are in blue. We have two types. We have integral and we have peripheral proteins. Integral proteins are also called transmembrane proteins because they span across the whole membrane. So they go from the top to the bottom. Peripheral are just on usually the underside, so the internal side of the plasma membrane, and they don't go all the way through. They only go partially through. And then the cytoskeletal fibers are on the bottom there by the internal, and those help stabilize the membrane and help it keep its structure. Those are cytoskeletal figments, pigment, filaments, sorry. So the carbohydrate chains are it's in green. They can either be glycolipids or glycoproteins. Glyco <clears throat> sorry, is the carbohydrate part. Lipid is a lipid as the name implies, protein is a protein. So if the carbohydrate chain is attached to a lipid, it's a glycolipid. If it's attached to a protein, it's a glycoprotein. These function very importantly in cell recognition. So they act as markers so that our immune system can identify cells as part of us. So they can identify the cells as self cells so that we don't destroy anything that belongs to us. We can recognize foreign versus us. And there's a glycoprotein. So again, you have the cytoskeletal fibers on the bottom or the internal part of the plasma membrane, and they function in stabilization. Those are intermediate filaments. And you have the cholesterol, which is in yellow here. And then we have the integral proteins, which go all the way through the membrane. And then you have peripheral proteins, which only go partially through. We have the phospholipid, which of course makes up the bilayer. And then the glycoprotein, which is the carbohydrate chain attached to that protein. So glycolipids are a phospholipid with the carbohydrate chain attached. Glycoproteins are an integral protein with a carbohydrate chain attached. Peripheral proteins are usually on the inner surface and they help stabilize it. And integral go all the way through. 
So why are integral proteins important? Part of them is for transport. Proteins in general perform six functions. So we have transport as one of them. You have two types of transport using integral proteins. You have channel proteins and you have carrier proteins. Channel proteins have a tunnel or a channel that go all the way through them. So they're gonna transport small molecules through this tunnel. So at any point in time, these ions or whatever it is can go straight through that protein. Aquaporins are an example as well. And these are tunnels for water basically. Or they could be a carrier protein where the molecule will actually bind to the protein and the protein will change its shape to get that molecule into the cell. And then you had cell recognition, sorry, the protein chains or carbohydrate chains we talked about. So we also have receptor proteins. Now receptor proteins happen when some sort of signaling molecule binds to the protein and then that causes the cell to do whatever the signal tells them to do. For example, insulin will bind to that receptor and allow glucose into the cell. Or if we have another hormone, that hormone will bind to the receptor and tell that cell to do whatever that hormone does. We have enzymes. Enzymatic proteins help catalyze reactions. We've talked about these before. So ATPase is an example. Remember, enzymes usually end in ASE, so ATPase is for ATP. And we're going to talk more about enzymes towards the end of the lecture. Then we have junctions proteins. These form cell-to-cell -cell connections. So they allow cells to stick together, which of course is going to be very important for cells, so they're not just floating all over the place. So why are these important? Because transport helps the cell maintain homeostasis so we can get nutrients in and wastes out. Things are gonna influence how they're transported across the membrane though. For example, small polar molecules are going to pass through pretty easily. So if they are non-charged, they're gonna pass through. If they're ions, they're gonna bounce back. If they're large, they're gonna bounce back. If they're small, they're gonna pass through. Non-lipids need help getting transported across the membrane. So lipid soluble will pass through. And the concentration gradient, if it's going from low concentration to high concentration, then it needs help to get through. So basically, if something is large, if it is charged, if it is not a lipid, or if it's going against its concentration gradient, they have to be helped across the lipid bilayer. So the plasmane is selectively permeable. However, it's going to let smaller, non-charged lipids through, especially if they're going from high concentration to low concentration. So we have three ways that materials can cross the plasma membrane through the phospholipid bilayer in a process called simple diffusion, which we're gonna talk about in a second, transport proteins using either channel or carrier proteins, and then bulk transport because we can form vesicles to get things in or out of the cell. So here's an overview of transport with a few examples. So, we have passive and active transport. Passive transport does not require ATP. Active transport requires ATP. So if you think about when you're active, you need more energy. So ATP is the energy for the cell. So active transport requires energy. So it kind of makes sense. Within passive transport, we either have no protein carrier as necessary or a protein carrier as necessary. If we don't need a protein carrier, that's what I was referring to as simple diffusion. Basically, whatever it is just passes right through the lipid bilayer. Gases and water are going to do this. So carbon dioxide and oxygen can pass right through the lipid bilayer. Osmosis is the movement of water through the bilayer, and we're going to talk about that in a second. Facilitated diffusion is when a protein carrier is necessary, so it either goes through a channel protein or a carrier protein. 
and glucose and amino acids are going to have to do that. And again, it's going from high concentration to low concentration. And all that means is that glucose is more concentrated on the outside of the cell than the inside of the cell. So it's going to go from where it's highly concentrated to where it's not as concentrated. Then we have active transport where we need ATP, so we need energy. We have two ways to do that. Active transport with a protein carrier, glucose, amino acids. The sodium potassium pump is a really good example. But things go from low concentration to high concentration. So they're going against their concentration gradient. So the sodium potassium pump, for example, is a very important pump. Whenever you do anything, your nervous system sends an impulse, an electrical impulse to your cells. And normally the concentrations of sodium outside the cell are high and potassium is high inside the cell. Well, when the action potential gets to the cell, sodium rushes into the cell. After the action potential reaches its maximum, potassium starts to leave the cell. And at the end of the whole thing, those concentrations need to be restored. So the sodium potassium pump will come in and pump three sodium out and pump two potassium in until those balances are restored. But remember, the concentration of sodium outside the cell is already high, so it's going against its concentration gradient. And then bulk transport via vesicle formation. There's two main types, exocytosis and endocytosis. We're going to talk about both of those in a second. So you have a chart in your portfolio that looks a lot like this. So again, for passive transport, we have simple diffusion, osmosis, or facilitated diffusion. So that means no ATP is required. Carrier proteins are only required for facilitated, and they all go from high to low concentration. Active transport requires energy, requires a carrier protein, and goes from low to high concentration. So simple diffusion is the movement from high to low. No ATP is required, no carrier protein. It simply goes right through the membrane. So carbon dioxide, oxygen. Osmosis, movement of water molecules from high to low concentration. No carrier protein, no ATP. Facilitated is from high to low through a carrier protein. No ATP required. An active transport is from low to high concentration through a carrier protein, and ATP is required. So we have simple diffusion. Again, it's just moving right through the plasma membrane. So if you think about if you've ever cut an onion or smelled something, it diffused through the air relatively quickly. So through the air is the fastest. And again, if you think about something diffusing through the air, there isn't a lot to block it. So it's going to spread out until all of the molecules hit equilibrium. Water, or through liquid basically, is the next fastest diffusion rate. So if you drop a piece of dye in a beaker of water, eventually those dye molecules are going to diffuse out until they're all equally spread out and you have equilibrium reached. And then diffusion through a semi-solid, that picture there is an auger plate, and basically we put a chunk of potassium permanganate in there, and you can time how fast it takes to diffuse through a semi-solid. And of course, that's the longest. So, passive, simple diffusion straight through the plasma membrane, facilitated diffusion through a carrier protein or through a channel protein, down their concentration gradient until an equilibrium is met. Active transport against their concentration gradient, so from low to high, and that's the sodium-potassium pump pictured there. Now, osmosis has some things that go along with it. Remember I said osmosis is the movement of water. So water is what's doing the moving, not the solute. Now, we talked before about a solution. A solution is a solvent that dissolves something called a solute. So salt water, for example. Sodium chloride is the solute, and water is the solvent. So water dissolves the sodium chloride. So tonicity 
is a term that's used to compare solute concentrations of solutions. So you can compare, if we talk about a cell for example, you can compare the inside of the cell to the environment around it. So we have three terms. We have isotonic, hypotonic, and hypertonic. Isotonic is when there's equal solutes. Hypotonic is when there's less solute in the environment and more solute in the cell. Hypertonic is when there's more solute in the environment and less solute in the cell. Now what happens is water will move down its concentration gradient from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. The solute concentration and the water concentration are going to be opposites because if you have more water, you have less solute. If you have less water, you have more solute. So in a hypotonic environment, you have less solute and more water. So the cell is gonna have more solute and less water. So water will move from its high concentration outside the cell to its low concentration inside the cell. And the cell will swell and potentially burst. So think of hypotonic, the O, the cell swells. So water moves into the cell. It's trying to dilute it down until the concentrations kind of balance out. So when water is balanced out, it will stop. Usually the animal cells are gonna burst before then. In a hypertonic environment, it's the opposite. You have more solute outside the cell than you do inside the cell, which means you have less water outside the cell and more water inside the cell. So water is gonna move down its concentration gradient from the inside of the cell to the outside of the cell. And the cell is going to shrink. We're gonna talk more about that in a second. So solution A is hypotonic to solution B, and solution B is hypertonic to solution A. So when you compare tonicities of solutions, you have to look at how the water will flow. So Water always goes from po to per, so from a hypotonic environment to a hypertonic environment. So a hypotonic environment has more water, so water will flow towards the hypertonic environment where there's less water. If you have this selectively permeable membrane, that water can cross, but solutes can't. And this direction of travel, this water movement, is called osmosis. So, if you have water on one side and you have sucrose on the other side and the sucrose cannot pass through that membrane, the water is going to move. And the water will move until you have an equal concentration of water on both sides of the membrane. So the question is, does the water stay level? Hopefully you said no because the water is going to move from the side with no sucrose to the side with sucrose until the water concentration is balanced out, which is going to cause the water volume on the side of the sucrose to rise. When will water stop moving to the right side? When equilibrium is reached. So when the water molecules are equally spread, that's when water will stop moving. And there's a little three minute video that you can watch as well. So if you have 5% dextrose in a dialysis bag and you have distilled water surrounding it, what's going to happen to the bag? Now think, you have more water outside the bag than inside the bag, more solutes inside the bag than outside the bag. So the water is going to go from high concentration to low concentration. So the water is going to move into the bag until the water molecules are at equilibrium. So the bag is going to get bigger and gain weight. Now we have some differences between animal cells and plant cells. So animal cells. Isotonic solution for animal cells is 0.9% NaCl. So if you go to the hospital and need an IV, they should give you somewhere around 0.9% NaCl. If animal cells are in this environment, there's no movement of water, everybody's happy. 
if you're in an environment less than 0.9% NAC, NACL. Water is going to move into the cell from PO to PER. The cell is going to swell and eventually burst. So hypotonic, the cell swells. This is called hemolysis. Lysis means break, hemo means blood. So blood breaks. In hypertonic environments, so more than 0.9% NACL, water will move out of the cell. Again, PO to PER, the cell will shrink. And in red blood cells, again, that's called cremation. And you guys have to know this terminology. Plant cells are a little different, though, because plant cells, very importantly, have a cell wall that surrounds them. Animal cells do not. So plant cells, again, isotonic is 0.9% NaCl, so there's no net movement of water. But in a hypotonic solution, so less than 0.9% NaCl, water is going to move into the cell, and the cell is going to swell a little bit. It's going to become rigid. It's not going to burst because that cell wall that surrounds it protects it. But you can see the difference between the isotonic picture and the hypotonic picture. You can see the swelling of everything inside the cell. This causes what we call turgor pressure. In a hypertonic environment, so more than 0.9% NaCl, water is still going to move out of the cell and the cell will become flaccid. You can see everything kind of pulls towards the inside of the cell away from the cell walls. It's not going to do anything else because of that cell wall protection, but this is called plasmolysis. This is associated with your plants if they're wilting. So if you look at these two plants, which plant has undergoing turgor pressure? And you can look at the microscopes. On the left-hand side, you can see that everything's kind of pulling into the center. On the right-hand side, you can see it's kind of swelling a little bit. So plant B is undergoing turgor pressure. Plant A is actually undergoing plasmolysis. So turgor pressure, again, water is taking, getting into the cell, but the cell wall is becoming rigid, and the plant will stay straight up. Plasmolysis, everything goes to the center, and the plant wilts. Then we have bulk transport, again. Large molecules transported across the plasma membrane by vesicle formation. ATP is required. Two types, remember, exocytosis and endocytosis. Exocytosis, think exit. Substances are transported out of the cell. So if we need to secrete a cell product like hormones or enzymes, we can secrete them out of the cell. We can get rid of waste, debris. The vesicles originate from the Golgi. And what happens is we surround whatever it is we want to get out of the cell with this vesicle. The vesicle will migrate to the plasma membrane. It will fuse with the plasma membrane and then expel its contents out to the outside. And that's exocytosis in a nutshell. Endocytosis is the reverse. We're taking substances into the cell. But there's three different types. We have phagocytosis, pinocytosis, and receptor-mediated endocytosis. Phagocytosis is for larger molecules, large particles, so like a bacterium. And basically what happens is the plasma membrane kind of reaches out, grabs whatever it is, surrounds it with a vesicle, brings it into the cell, and then we do whatever we're supposed to do with it. White blood cells will engulf particles like this, for example. This is also called cell eating because the, the particles are larger. Pinocytosis is also referred to as cell drinking because they're smaller particles, so macromolecules. What happens is a plasma membrane kind of invaginates and folds in on itself, surrounds the molecule, and brings it into the cell. The vesicle will then go wherever it needs to go. The last one is kind of special. Receptor-mediated is selective pinocytosis. So we have receptors that, <coughs> sorry, are on the membrane, and something like a hormone will bind to that receptor. The plasma membrane will still invaginate on itself and then surround it with a vesicle. But that vesicle is special because it's covered with a clathrin protein coat. That clathrin coat protects whatever it is inside. 
and then we send it where it needs to go. So this is going to be selective. Substance is the maternal blood going into the fetal blood at the placenta, for example. Another example. Okay, moving on to cell junctions. Plants are pretty simple. They have one type of cell junction. It's called plasmodesmata. It's channels between the cell walls. They're always open, and they always allow flow between neighboring cells. This way they can share nourishment, water, or messages. If you look at a cell under a microscope, live cells, you can actually see cytoplasm streaming between cells. It's actually kind of cool. Animals, however, are not so easy. Animals have three different types of junctions. We have anchoring junctions, which are called desmosomes. They basically allow flexibility. So they provide a sturdy but flexible sheet of cells. This allows tissues and certain organs to stretch. So if you look at that picture, you can see there's room between the attachments. So they're like spot welds or rivets. So in your skin, for example, you can pick up your skin and it's not going to tear. It stretches and goes back to where it's supposed to be. So in areas that need this, like the heart, the stomach, the bladder, the skin, we're going to have that flexibility. Tight junctions are another type. Now tight, as the name implies, form a tight seal. So the adjacent cells are basically zipped together. So this allows fluid to be contained within those cells. So these are going to be in areas where we don't want the fluid to get out, like the stomach, the intestines, the bladder, the kidney. Our gastric fluid has a pH of about 2. You don't want gastric fluid leaking out into other organs because it will basically start to dissolve them. So if you look at the picture there, you can see it's a tight seal. There isn't a space between those cells. And the last one are gap junctions. Gap junctions are the communicating junctions. So these are channels between the plasma membrane that allows the cells to communicate quickly and in a coordinated manner. So ions can pass through. Molecules can pass right through. These are very important in our heart. Our heart has what's called intercalated discs. And in these intercalated discs are a bunch of gap junctions. So that allows our heart to contract as a unit. That allows our, the top of our heart to fully contract before the bottom of our heart starts to contract. If we didn't have that, we would have backflow and we wouldn't function properly. So it's for rapid nerve conduction and contractions, basically. And it's always so it can contract together, so it can function as a unit, basically. So plasmodesmata, whoops, I am so sorry. Plasmodesmata are functionally and structurally similar to gap junctions. With respect to, they're always open. Plasmodesmata in plants are always open. Gap junctions are always open. Molecules and ions can pass through readily. Okay, now, energy. The sun is the ultimate source of energy, of course. Solar energy comes out, and without it, living things will not be able to survive. We have to maintain organization. We have to be able to grow, repair, reproduce, and we need that constant input of energy. So energy is just the capacity to do work. The reason the sun is the ultimate source of all energy is because photosynthesizers turn that energy into chemical energy that us plain old autotrophs can't, or heterotrophs, sorry, can't make for ourselves. So we have two major categories of energy, kinetic and potential. Kinetic energy is the energy of motion. Potential is stored energy. So if you look at that cat on the right-hand side, the cat has potential energy when it's sitting down and transforms it to kinetic energy when it jumps up to the counter. So think about you all have the potential to do well. It's when you transfer that potential into energy of motion and actually doing that you can accomplish it. So another example would be a diver. If they're sitting at the bottom of the ladder, standing at the bottom of the ladder, they have potential energy. They climb up the ladder and that transforms to kinetic energy. They're standing at the top again 
we have potential energy, and when they dive into the pool, it's transformed to kinetic energy again. Chemical energy is the energy we find in our food, so that's stored energy. Mechanical energy is like when you're walking or running or rowing a boat or moving or anything like that. So that's kinetic energy. Potential energy is stored in chemical bonds, so glucose and ATP. When the chemical bonds are broken, energy is given off. So on the left-hand side there you have glucose, and glucose is usually what plants will make to give us, consumers, we then use that to make ATP through respiration. So glucose is usually a product of photosynthesis. ATP is a product of respiration. So you see ATP there, it's adenine, which so it's unfamiliar, like a base for DNA and RNA maybe. Ribose is a sugar, and three phosphates. Now that last phosphate is a very high energy bond and it's kind of unstable because of the energy. So it readily detaches. And when it does, it gives off energy. The interesting thing about us, is, or ATP, is that ATP basically provides just enough energy for cellular work. So we don't waste ATP, which is a good thing. So muscle movement, moving molecules across ATP, synthesis reactions, all ATP. Calories are a measure of energy. It's basically the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. Nutrition labels give you a lot of information on what you're eating. So if you're trying to watch what you eat, that's what you need to read. It tells you how much protein, how much carbs, how much fat is in there, how much cholesterol, sodium, calories. And the very important is you have to look at the serving size and then look at how many servings are per container. Because if you look at the calories and say, oh, there's only 150 calories in this, and then eat the whole thing and look back, and there were four servings in that, whatever you ate, you just ate 600 calories. Okay, thermodynamics is the study of energy transformations. So energy is the capacity to do work. We care about the first two laws of thermodynamics. The first law of thermodynamics is the law of conservation. Basically, all it says is that energy cannot be created or destroyed. It's changed from one form to another. So all we can do is transform energy. We don't make it. We don't destroy it. We transform it. So solar energy goes to chemical energy, which goes to mechanical energy, for example. So if we have potential versus kinetic. Potential is the gas in your car. Kinetic is when you step on the gas and the car moves. Or potential energy in glucose can be used to make ATP, which can then be used to do the work of the cell. The second law of thermodynamics is energy cannot be changed from one form to another without losing energy. Most of the energy that's lost is in the form of heat. So when energy is transformed, we can only keep some of it to use, basically. The rest is lost as heat, and unfortunately, there's nothing we can do about it. Heat is not a usable form of energy, but it can be used to help maintain our body temperature. So it's still important. So the gas in the car, when it transforms into kinetic energy, heat is lost. You can feel if a car has been running recently because the hood is hot. That's the heat generated. Glucose transformed to ATP, we lose heat. ATP performs work, we lose heat. But that heat helps our body maintain temperature, or if we get too hot, we sweat. So some concepts here. Potential energy can be converted into kinetic and vice versa. So just like the diver that I gave you, she has, or he has potential energy at the bottom of the ladder. They climb, it transforms to kinetic. They stand at the top, it transforms back to potential. They dive, it transforms back to kinetic. Conversion is not always efficient. It's about 40% efficient, as a matter of fact. As those conversions occur, most of the energy is changed into heat.
and living things always lose heat to the environment. So we need that constant input of energy required, which is, of course, the sun. So the sun is the ultimate source of energy. Autotrophs then use that to transform it into chemical energy. And then heterotrophs use that to transform it into mechanical energy. Heat gives disorder to the system. And the amount of disorder is measured as entropy. So the universe as a whole goes to more chaos. We have an increasing disorder. So if you think about water, when you boil water, it changes to steam. Steam is a lot more disorganized than water is. So that's kind of like representing our universe. And remember, we're talking about the universe as a whole, not just you. We're talking about the universe goes towards more disorder. And we have ATP, so the energy of our cells. The structure, again, is adenine, ribose, three phosphates. That last phosphate, as I said, is high energy. When it releases, it gives off energy and forms ADP, or adenosine diphosphate. And it goes back and forth. So ATP breaks the bond, gives off energy. We put it back on, requires energy. So just enough energy is released so that we do not waste anything. And consuming and regenerating the ATPs occur about once every minute. So it's a lot. And if you think about it, you always need energy, even when you're sleeping, because your heart's always beating, your lungs are always breathing, so you always need energy. Metabolism, remember, is the sum of all chemical reactions occurring in the cell. That's one of the characteristics of life we talked about in Chapter 1. We have two types of chemical reactions, endergonic and exergonic. Endergonic reactions require energy. So they're building up molecules and forming bonds. They're also called synthesis reactions. They're also called, sorry, <clears throat> anabolic reactions. So endergonic, synthesis, same thing. So if you have A and B and you want to combine them, you need an input of energy. ADP plus the phosphate, you need an input of energy to form ATP. So the products are going to have more energy than the reactants. So what's coming out of the equation is going to have more than what went in. The other kind is exergonic. So this is the opposite. This is releasing energy when you're breaking down molecules and breaking bonds. These are also called degradation reactions. So exergonic, degradation, you could also call them catabolic. So AB yields A plus B and gives you energy in the process. ATP yields ADP plus a phosphate and gives you energy in the process. So the products actually have less potential energy than the reactants because they're giving off so much energy released. So if you're talking about potential energy versus energy released, they're two different things, okay? So products have less potential energy simply because they gave it all off. They gave it away. And the other ones, products have more potential energy because they haven't released it yet. Okay? So if you look at this equation, carbon dioxide plus water in the presence of solar energy gives you a carbohydrate plus oxygen. It is endergonic because it requires energy. It is synthesis because you're making a carbohydrate, and it actually represents photosynthesis. The other one is a carbohydrate plus oxygen yields ATP plus carbon dioxide and water. It is exergonic because it's giving off energy. It is degradation because you're breaking down that carbohydrate. And this is actually the equation for cellular respiration. We can couple reactions, which means that we can use an exergonic reaction to fuel an endergonic reaction. So that the energy that's released from that exergonic reaction can actually drive the endergonic reaction. So why is this important? Well, because carbohydrate plus energy gives you carbon dioxide plus water. <clears throat> 
gives you that ATP, that's respiration. ATP provided with carbon dioxide, water, gives you carbohydrate plus oxygen, that's photosynthesis. So respiration and photosynthesis can kind of fuel each other in a sense. And we'll talk more about that in the next chapters. Okay, enzymes, the last thing we gotta talk about. Enzymes help speed up reactions because they are catalysts. So they're proteins, which means they can be denatured, and they're specific for their substrate. They have an active site, which is where their substrate fits in. They usually end in ASE. And what they do is they lower the activation energy for a reaction. And what this means is that the activation energy is basically the amount of energy it takes for a reaction to occur. So if you picture pushing a huge rock up a huge hill, that's going to take a lot of energy. What an enzyme will come do is cut the mountain in half. So now you're pushing that rock up half the mountain. It's not going to take as much energy. So it lowers that activation energy required. The substrate is what is changed into a product. So that's what binds to the enzyme. The enzyme substrate complex is just the enzyme and the substrate bound together. The induced fit model just refers to the fact that once the substrate binds to the enzyme, it kind of molds around it a little bit so that it has the optimum fit. After the reaction is over, the enzyme leaves unchanged, doesn't get tired, doesn't get worn out. We can reuse it over and over again. And the product, which is formed from the chemical reaction. So enzymes speed up these metabolic reactions. Without enzymes, the reactions would still occur, but they would be so slow that the organism would die. So the enzyme speeds it up by lowering the activation energy, which is the energy needed to start the equation, the reaction. The active site is where the substrate fits on the enzyme, and the induced fit model just means that the enzyme kind of alters its active site basically to help get the optimum fit. Picture here shows you with and without an enzyme, the graph I should say, so the activation energy is a lot higher without the enzyme. Enzymes are specific, they can only react with a certain substrate. Usually they're named by taking the substrate and putting an ASE on it. So urea, urease, lactose, lactase, sucrose, sucrase, lipid, lipase, you get the idea. So it takes a lot of different enzymes to catalyze all of the reactions within cells. But we don't have to make a lot of enzymes because remember the enzymes leave the equation unchanged. So they're not consumed during the reaction. So they can be used over and over and over again. So for example, we don't have lactase just roaming around our body. We only make lactase when we ingest lactose. And then we only make enough that's going to take care of the lactose we ingested. So we're very efficient like that. So if you have an enzyme, the substrate binds to it, making the enzyme substrate complex, and then you have the enzyme go off and that product go off in the top one there. Is that synthesis or degradation? Hopefully you said degradation because it's a polypeptide broken down into two dipeptides. The other one, you have the enzyme plus the two substrates coming in and the product leaves put together and the enzyme's still there. Hopefully you know that synthesis because you're building something. So factors that re affect the rate of reactions. This is what your lab is about. So the maximum weight rate occurs when enough substrates available to fill the active sites. Substrate concentration is the first thing that can affect the rate of reaction. If you increase the concentration, you increase the rate of the reaction, but only to a point. It will level off at one point. That doesn't mean it stops. It just levels off because all of the active sites are full. So increasing the substrate will temporarily increase the rate of the reaction, and then it will just stay steady until it's all gone. Temperature affects the rate of the reaction. 
If you increase the temperature, you will increase the rate, but again, only to a point. Heat tends to speed things up. Cold tends to slow things down. However, temperature is one of those things that can denature proteins, and proteins are, or enzymes are proteins. So if you have something too hot, if the enzyme is too hot, it will denature. So the chart gives you an example of an optimal temperature at 37 degrees Celsius. So anything way above that, the enzyme is going to denature. It's not going to work anymore. Anything below that, it's going to be slower. pH is the third thing that affects the rates of reaction. So again, each enzyme has an optimal pH. You adjust the pH, you can increase the rate. If you have an optimal pH of 7, let's say, then everything around 7, you should be good. But if you go too far out or too far down, the enzyme is going to denature because temperature, pH, and ion concentrations are the three things that can denature proteins. Enzymes are proteins, so temperature and pH can denature the protein. Enzymes, some of them need cofactors and or coenzymes to function properly. Cofactors are inorganic or coenzymes are organic, but coenzymes are considered cofactors as well. But cofactors are metals such as copper, zinc, iron. Coenzymes are non-protein molecules. We need vitamins to make these. NAD, FAD, and coenzyme A are three examples that we'll be talking about with respiration and photosynthesis. So just FYI. So this is just showing you a coenzyme will kind of help the enzyme and the substrate fit perfectly. We also have to have a way to prevent too much product from being made. So we have two types of inhibition. We have competitive inhibition and non-competitive inhibition. Competitive inhibition, as you can imply from the name, it's a direct competition. So the inhibitor competes with the substrate for the active site. So whoever gets their first kind of thing will block the, sub will block the active site. Non-competitive inhibition is not a direct competition. So the inhibitor will bind to an allosteric site somewhere else away from the active site, but that causes the active site to change its shape. So now the substrate can't bind anymore. So either way, the substrate can't bind. It's just either if the active site is blocked or if the active site is changed its shape. Inhibitions are usually reversible but there are some poisons out there where they can be irreversible. So for example, cyanide. Cyanide is going to stop ATP from being made. It messes with the enzymes that make ATP. So you won't have energy to do anything and you'll suffocate. Um, sarin is a poison that actually blocks the neuromuscular junctions which the neuromuscular junctions are where your neurons meet your muscles. So that's how your muscles contract. So sarin blocks that, so it prevents contraction. So you're paralyzed. So feedback inhibition is a normal mechanism used to control how much product we make. So basically the final product acts as a temporary inhibitor. So you have A to E. You have B, C, and D in the middle. An enzyme is required for each stage. So you have the first enzyme, the second one, the third one, and the fourth one. So if you ever asked how many enzymes are in a step, count the number of arrows. That's how many enzymes you need. Every arrow is an enzyme. The final product will come in and allosterically bind somewhere else on that enzyme so that that substrate can no longer bind. So anywhere in the pathway, you can stop production if you don't have that enzyme. Because again, every enzyme or each step requires an enzyme. So if you have this final product acting as a temporary inhibitor, it's gonna shut the pathway off. 
as long as it's not acting as that inhibitor, the pathway will be turned on. So if this is making lactase, we'll say, once we have enough lactase, it will bind and be temporarily shut off. If we, until we have enough though, it will not be binding and the pathway will be functioning properly. But this shows you how important enzymes are because if you're missing an enzyme, you're missing a step in a pathway and you're not going to be able to break things down or make things depending on what that is. Now it can be something relatively harmless, like if you can't make lactase, then you're lactose intolerant and have to avoid dairy products. Or it could be something deadly. For example, the hex A enzyme breaks down lipids. If you do not have the hex A enzyme, lipids build up in your brain and you unfortunately don't make it. So enzymes are very important in our lives. So again, pH, temperature, substrate concentration are the three factors that affect the rate of the reaction. Substrate concentration, if you increase it, you'll increase it to a point and then it'll level off. Temperature, if you increase it, it will increase the rate of reaction to a point and then the enzyme becomes denatured. pH, if it's at its optimal pH, which is different for all enzymes, the enzyme will function the best and then outside of that, the further away you get from that, the more the enzyme becomes denatured. And again, it depends on the enzyme. Pepsin, for example, is an enzyme in our gastric, our stomach area. pH is 2, so the optimal pH for that is 2. But trypsin, for example, is not. Catalase is not. So those optimal pHs are more closer to 7. So as long as it's at its optimal pH, whatever that is for the enzyme, it'll be functioning at the maximum rate. The further away you get from that, the more chance you're going to have the enzyme denature. Okay, so that is it. We will cover photosynthesis next, and I will talk to you later. Bye.